Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Good morning and welcome to church. We are so glad you could join us today. Before we begin announcements, I want to remind you that today is a very special day. We will be having our drive through communion, which means you should be at the church at 10.30 a.m. to participate. This is all new to us and I think it's going to be an exciting time. There will be live music as well as an opportunity to take communion elements with Pastor Dean. If you started this video at the normal time of 10 a.m., you'll need to be mindful of the time and pause the video when it comes time to go to communion. This week we'll be looking at Psalm 8. The psalmist begins by saying, Praise be to the Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Whether you're watching from Yakima or from afar, we encourage you today to praise the Lord for all He has created. As I mentioned, we'll be offering communion today. If you're not ready to leave your house, um, or if you're not close, that's totally okay. We have also provided a communion opportunity at the end of this video. If you choose to do that though, you'll have to make sure that you have your own communion elements ready. Um, if you do choose to join us in the parking lot, remember that Dan Brown of Love, Inc. will be there to accept donations. During this time, more now than ever, it's important to provide these essential resources for those in need. As we participate in worship through giving this week, Acts 20.35 reminds us that Jesus told us it's more blessed to give than to receive. As we give this week, think of the blessings God has given you during this difficult time. By now, we really hope that you have connected with our online newsletter, but if not, please contact the church by calling or emailing. As always, remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on YouTube. Hope your morning is great and enjoy the service.
8, according to Eugene Peterson's The Message. God, brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle choruses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. Then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Yet we've so narrowly missed being gods, bright with Eden's dawn light. You put us in charge of your handcrafted world, repeated to us your Genesis charge, made us lords of sheep and cattle, even animals out in the wild, birds flying and fish swimming, whales singing in the ocean deeps. God, brilliant Lord, your name echoes around the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds our hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Of God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great thou art! sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. Good morning. So glad you've all decided to join us for worship at Yakima Covenant Church today. I hope each one of you will be blessed as you will become a part of this worship service. And will you now join me in the prayers of the people? 
Dear Lord, your word says that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are with us. Even though we aren't able to be together in person, we're thankful that we can all be together with you in spirit. Dear Lord, as we go through this uncertain time of COVID-19, we are grateful that you are the certainty we can always count on. Lord, we pray for our government leaders that they will turn to you for guidance. May they seek to find solutions to our country's problems by working together instead of spending so much time apart bickering over which side is right or wrong. Lord, we pray for the doctors and other medical professionals that are working on finding vaccines that will limit the spread of this virus. Give them the guidance needed that they may be successful in finding the answers they seek. Lord, we pray for those who serve in ministry. We are so grateful that they can continue to minister to us on Facebook, YouTube, and other online methods. Bless them as they spend many hours each week preparing our worship services. Dear Father, we pray for all the health care workers, doctors, nurses, and others on the front lines of dealing with this pandemic. May they be kept safely in your care. Give them the time, the strength, and health to be able to do the difficult job of caring for those who are sick. Dear Father, we pray for those who have been tested positive for COVID-19. We pray that they are on their way back to good health. And Lord, we pray asking for peace and comfort for families who have lost loved ones as a result of this disease. We pray for others in our community that are suffering from many other illnesses or injuries besides the COVID-19, such as cancers, heart diseases, kidney diseases, accidents, and many more. We pray that they are getting the medical treatment and care they need as well. I pray that each one of us will do our part to help stop the spread of this virus by following the guidelines set forth by our medical professionals. Lord, we pray for those who've been laid off from work or have lost their jobs. We pray that they are able to find the resources they need to keep their families fed and their basic housing needs met. We pray that soon they will be able to return back to work so they may be able to provide for their families. We pray for those whose homes were damaged during our recent windstorm. We pray they're getting the help they need. We're so grateful that there were no serious injuries we caused by the storm. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for those in recent days who have turned to violent demonstrations over the injustices that have been done to others. May they instead find peaceful ways to express their anger, seeking to help and find solutions instead of creating more and more violence. Lord, we pray for our missionaries in your service all around the world. We pray that you will continue to bless the work they do and provide them with your protection for health and safety. Lord, we pray for the people of Haiti and for all impoverished people around the world. So many of them lack access to enough food clean water, and medical treatment. Help their governments and health organizations to find ways to provide the help they so desperately need. Lord, even though our world has been turned upside down by this pandemic, we still have so much to be thankful for. We can still freely worship you. For that, we say, thank you, Lord. We have access to the necessities of life, families and friends nearby. For those things, we say, thank you, Lord. We have the medical assistance we need and so much more. Again, we say, thank you, Lord. When we get discouraged, Lord, may we stop and count our many blessings. And again, for all of these things, we say together, thank you, Lord. May we remember always that you are with us and that you will see us through this time of uncertainty. On this Communion Sunday, Lord, we remember the sacrifice that you made for us. May we always remember that only in you can we find rest, peace, and eternal life. And now will you please join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We've been in various locations, orchards uh, for the Emmaus Road. We went out to Rim Rock where we looked at walking on the, the water with Jesus. And tonight, uh, late at night, we're on the outside uh, of the city limits, uh, a place where the poet uh, wrote Psalm 8 in, uh, as he looked up in the skies. Next week, Thomas and I were thinking we should go to the Swiss Alps and look at Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I'll have to check the church budget to see if that allows for something like that. Psalm 8 opens with a vivid depiction, as you've heard the scripture, of a person standing alone in the evening, uh, staring up at the starry, vast sky, wonderment, uh, overcome with the question about humanity's uh, place in this vast universe. Alone, outside, at night, seemingly insignificant, an expanse of heaven, and the psalmist declares, you made your glory higher than the heavens. Continues on, when I look up at your skies, uh, what your fingers have made, when I look at the moon and the stars, you set them firmly in place. What an incredible passage of scripture. Uh, while most translations uh, have inclusive language for uh, translates it as human beings, uh, we probably ought to take note to stop for a moment and see that the force of verse 7 is much more. It's, uh, what am I? What am I, a single insignificant person that God should take note of me? We're out here in the months of the stars in which the psalmist wrote is appropriate. We'd be preach I'd be preaching from this setting. Uh, if we were not in COVID-19 time, we wouldn't be able to have this opportunity. But in light of all of this, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them as I see up in the sky, the, the stars? That's the question. That's the question that the psalmist uh, sets in motion for us to look at. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name and throughout the earth. You made your glory higher than the heavens. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers have made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings uh, that you pay attention uh, to them? Have you ever felt that way? Maybe it was standing on uh, the rim of Grim, uh, Grand Canyon. For you hikers, it's I hear about uh, Cold Chuck Lake or the uh, enchantments. And for most of us, uh, looking up into the skies in our backyard, that's, uh, you have this apt uh, feeling of uh, being small amidst this incredible majesty. Billions upon millions of stars. Wasn't that what the astronomer, astronomer Carl Sagan put it? Billions and billions. Our big universe, only one of a dozens of, of universes. And we look, and we exclaim, Lord, our Lord, how majestic your name throughout the earth. You made your glory higher than heaven. It's a cold heart of an unimaginative person that would sit beneath a vast canopy of stars and and not cry out, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. The poet of Psalm 8 stared into the night sky, properly dazzled as, what, by what he saw. But uh, really, to put it mildly, what he did not see was, was a lot. Uh, you look back to his time and place, there was a lot he did not see. Had, had the psalmist been alive today, uh, to just this last week to see the SpaceX launch, uh, to see the pictures of it taking off, or even not that far back of the Hubble pictures of, of outer space, uh, the incredible nature. Had the psalmist been able to spend a, a scant, even 10 minutes uh, behind a telescope, uh, doubtlessly fainted at the incredible wonderment. 
ancient astronomers, uh, incredible, skilled mapping out uh, the night sky, even being able to predict uh, the star's movement. They, they were incredible at what they would study and see. Uh, what puzzled the early scientists was uh, these handful of stars as they looked up in the sky that would behave uh, refused to behave uh, the way that they expected them. About a half dozen stars, uh, not march lockstep with the others. Instead, they meandered just kind of all over the place, and they had a hard time figuring out or making sense of that. The Greeks finally called these mystery stars wanderers, uh, believing that they were inerrant, uh, errant stars that uh, lost their, their way through the universe. The Greek word for wandering is planeo, it's an English word where we get the word planet. Now, now we know the reason why these wandering stars behaved not uh, stars at all, but rather they were worlds of, of stars, uh, worlds all on their own, uh, galaxies all on their own. Now we have these incredible up-close pictures of uh, Venus and Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. I can't wait to see what SpaceX is going to give us for pictures. Beauty that's incredibly stunning. But Poet uh, in Psalm 8 didn't know any of that. He saw a, a rather a pinprick of lights twinkling in the night sky, and he was incredibly overjoyed, something that we all can take in. Uh, how much more cause for joy that, that we have? You know, there's an estimated 10 billion galaxies in the universe. And each galaxy, get this, containing perhaps 100 billion, 100 billion stars. In other words, not only the stars see in the night sky that are far away, they're only a mere fraction of what is really out there. Now, take all that mind-numbing data and do with it what you will, whether atheists or believers alike, if you're watching. Uh, do with it as you will. Some years back, uh, Time Magazine published uh, some Hubble telescope pictures. I know as a kid, just being taken in by those magnificent photos, luminous, gorgeous, enormous pillars of clouds of, of gas and just a few weeks later someone wrote a letter to the editors uh, stating that those photo, those photos should finally put an end to this religious idea that humanity really amounts to anything that humanity really has any significance at all not only clearly not a, the center of the universe but that this person wrote we don't even register even Psalm 8 admits that this wonders of the universe in which you look up it recognizes that it is humbling. Of course, we, we don't need to go to space uh, to see such wonders, uh, to, to get a glimpse of that. We can, we can just simply scoop up a, a teaspoon of uh, soil out, a topsoil from the forest floor, and uh, look at a microscope, and we can find upwards to uh, 1,400 billion, or beetles uh, and uh, springtails, not to mention 2 billion fungi and algae and protozoa just in one teaspoon of topsoil. Or if we were here in the daylight to look at the birds of the air, there's the Arctic terns who flies 10,000 miles round trip each year, 10,000 miles. Its winter home is in the Antarctic and a summer home is in Asia. Meanwhile, the northern fulmer spends its entire life out on the ocean, wondrously ability to drink uh, seawater. The fulmar has an entire desalinization factory in its beak, removing salt from its water, excretiating that through a tube and on top of its beak, and now drinking fresh water. What I think we can say as we look around creation is that the universe is, is clotted with wonder, both on the, the macro and the micro levels, both on a human and non-human creatures. It, it, it's incredible what we see. 
the cosmos teems with life and complexity, with a sense of music and movement, a sense with complexity. It, it is an amazing thing. It is every bit as humbling as Psalm 8 claims it is. But Psalm 8, the psalmist is not designed to make us feel like nothing. Instead, remarkably, in that brief compass of only just 70 Hebrew words, uh, reveals to us something incredibly significant. Uh, Psalm 8 directs us how to think about God and creation and to think about it as our relationship between all of it. Psalm 8 is the first psalm uh, of praise in the book of the Psalms. Uh, also, it's the only one of the 150 psalms that directs our address to God throughout the entire poem. The whole poem is a directed address to God. How incredibly curious and instructive that the first psalm of praise in the Bible is praise about creation. As recently as 50 years ago or even maybe if you want to go back 75 years ago, biblical scholars were convinced that uh, ancient Israel was not really had a whole lot of care, much care for creation. Many scholars thought that it was focused on re redemption, a, a covenant of with Abraham, looking at the exile, exodus of, of Egypt. But Psalm 8 is one of a, a bevy of texts uh, that proves these sentiments wrong. Psalm 8 has as its focus uh, uh, that creation matters. It was enormously important in, to the Israelites. The cosmos, the handiwork of God, was a target of redemption, so much so that the Israelites not even conceive of salvation apart from the promise of good land flowing with milk and honey. This creation was a part of the redemptive process, and it's carried out uh, by God's work. Larry Rasmussen, a uh, scholar, points out that throughout the Old Testament, it's difficult to distinguish between salvation from the good highlands of agriculture, uh, God's plans, God's purposes, God's promises, were again and again tied to things like soil and fruit and flocks and meadows and, and things like wine and wheat. Maybe that's why it combines two of my favorite things, an undergraduate in agriculture and my love for the scriptures as being a pastor. As Rasmussen said, perhaps the ultimate reason why the first day that they beat swords into plowshares, or, or maybe we should say beat armored howitzer tanks into John Deere uh, garden tractors. It says that not only was it a warfare would cease, that, that warfare would end, that riding would end, but also so that it would return us to our proper vocation, to our proper work of focusing on earth keeping and of tending and, and tilling the garden of God's good creation. See, creation matters because as Psalm 8 makes clear, God himself loved his creation. I know many Christians today are uh, fearful of uh, pantheism, that uh, declaring that earth uh, as a divine goddess. Um, unfortunately, uh, sadly, our desire to put daylight between ourselves and such heresies has caused us also to uh, steer clear of, of biblical ways of describing this cosmos. In Psalm 8, uh, the psalmist has no problem saying that the physical world is uh, the glory of God. Uh, the, the stars, the suns, the moon, the flocks, the, the beasts, the birds, all the rest uh, declare uh, the glory of God. Psalm 8 begins and ends with declaring that God's name is visible in all of the earth. What that means is a, a proper, uh, the proper point of the stars is to say, I see God there. By no means is it pantheistic to see a field wildflowers and, and connect it to, to God. 
when an art expert comes across a painting and declares that, hey, that's a Picasso or that's a Rembrandt, uh, it's not to mean that the artist and that oil streak across that canvas is the same thing. It's just simply to say when you see a painting, you recognize who did it, whose handiwork that is so clearly on display that you know who that artist is, that it's his or her work of, of art, and you can, you can name it. So also Psalm 8. Uh, the God's presence is in the cosmos, that his handiwork is made so clear. When you see it, you know it's God. So when you see, uh, it runs a gamut from uh, gossamer threads on the uh, moss wings to Kathy and I just seeing a hummingbird just the other day, and its wings beat 80 times in one second to the globular clusters of the uh, stars in the sky and in space uh, to know when you see it you say that's the handiwork of God. Uh, God made it all. Rem remains active in its preservation and its flourishing. Psalm 8 calls us to look for and to find God in the beauty of the galaxies whether you're peering through a, a telescope or a microscope, uh, watching a white-tailed deer leaping across the meadow or uh, the wonders of the design of one's own foot. Uh, what we're seeing is nothing less than the glory of God. All that, however, is just the first half of Psalms 8's larger purpose. The other half addresses something sometimes called the, the humanity question. It's the question about what is our place and what is our purpose in life? Who are we and how do we fit into this incredible world in which we, we live, this creation? It's without, again, without uh, knowing uh, how vast the space is, the psalmist saw uh, the moon and the stars and he felt like nothing in comparison. We, though, still more, have more cause to feel that way today. Many thinkers now proclaim humanity as nothing or at least uh, nothing special, but the Bible clearly disagrees. Someone was, uh, the psalmist, someone, whoever it was, was dazed at the wonder of creation without the benefit of all we know about the galaxies and the, these parallel universes that are there. The psalmist felt simultaneously tiny, yet enormously important. Uh, the psalmist saw his connection to his place in, in all of creation. If, if there's anything more marvelous than uh, the sheer scale of the splendor of the universe, it is a revelation that in all of its vastness, we really do matter. In all of it, God is saying we matter. We've been endowed with the image of God or as Psalm 8 puts it, crowned with glory and honor. See, God's gift was to put us in charge of this cosmos, to tend, to keep, to rule it to, on God's behalf. It's precisely our God-likeness that allows us to feel small in the first place. It's our God-likeness that has that ability to to frame things and to see things. We have the ability to which we can, so far as we can tell, no other critter on the planet has. And that is namely the ability to note and to study, to appreciate and to catalog, to photograph and to record and to celebrate uh, the otherness. As far as I know, the midnight parrot fish uh, that swims around the coral reefs has, does not have that ability to, to do that. Do you remember that, that Coca-Cola commercial uh, of the polar bears? I, I loved it. It might have been in the Super Bowl uh, where that would be ooing and eyeing and just kicking back on their, their lawn chairs and looking up at the northern lights. Well, of, of course, uh, real polar bears don't pause to observe the colorful uh, spectacle that, that we do. C.S. Lewis uh, was quoted as saying, for long centuries, God perfected the animal form, which was to become the, the vehicle of humanity and the image of himself. In the fullness of time, God caused to descend upon this organism a new kind of consciousness, which 
could say I and me, which could look upon itself as an object which knew God, which could make judgments of truth and beauty and goodness, and which was so far above time that it could perceive time flowing past. C.S. Lewis said sooner or later they wanted some corner in the universe of which they could say to God, this is our business and not yours. But there is no such corner, C.S. Lewis ends. This poet in, in Psalm 8 chooses to give the credit of creation to God, it recognizes his place within its creation. A healthy self-image to know that it has enough humility to see oneself made by God as God's creation. Enough healthy pride and made it that he's made in the image of God, given responsibility to care for and to real rule, to teach other, uh, others about dignity and to see his fellow human beings, uh, despite the color of their skin, as a child of God, as an important that deserves uh, value and significance. We spent time in Italy. I love following the story of uh, St. Uh, Francis of Assisi. There's a, sta a statue of St. Francis of Assisi in, or sta a statue of St. Francis in Assisi that I love. It's Francis lying on his back, and Francis is extolled as one who uh, loved God for his creation like, like no one else. And I think he'd ask us to find time for praising, to joining him in laying back on the grass, whether it's at night or during the day, to take time to see our place in all of this creation and appreciate and value this incredible creation that is given to us. And be able to say, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And seeing the significance of that, let's bow in prayer. God, we give you thanks for Psalm 8, for its uh, praise, uh, a, a, a psalm of praise. Uh, we give you thanks for its way of teaching us and to uh, seeing, uh, taking time to reflect on your good creation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the Lord's table. The Savior invites those who trust him to share in the feast that he has prepared. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took a, a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also he took the cup after the supper and saying, this cup is a new covenant to my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for your sacrificial gift, for the way in which you came to this earth and in love demonstrated your care for us and love for us. Lord, we ask for your blessing on these elements now as we take them in our home or as we come to drive up in our car, that, uh, Lord, you would meet us in new ways. Bless this bread which we together eat and this cup which we together drink. Amen. This is the body, the blood of Christ, broken and shed for you. Take and eat. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We're glad that you are part of our worship service this morning. And if you are wanting to come to the, the church for communion, we invite you to come now. We'll be here from 1030 to 11 or, or beyond that point. Uh, so continue to, to enter into worship at this time. Praise God from the